Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Today on the show, we're joined by Michael Carter, aka Bits Beat Trippin, a Bitcoin mining OG. We talk about him going to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas last week. We also talk about mining cycles, when to deploy capital, and ASIC prices. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Really excited to talk about mining cycles, history of mining, and really where we're at right now in, in the mining cycles. Uh, you guys are building right now. A lot, a lot of other people are you know, storing cash under the mattress. Uh, so <laughs> excited to get your take today. Great to see you. Yeah, thanks again, man. Love to be on uh, and just kind of share some experience. We haven't had a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of videos out lately because we've been doing a, a lot in the space right now when it comes to the build we got a five megawatt build uh in, in mid process we're about the light with that uh some consolidation from our gpu stuff now since ethereum's moved on the proof of stake and you know there's a lot of gpus out there so uh folks are keeping the other networks up and running but it keeps the that profitability really low um and just the interaction there so just really focused right now on the bitcoin space and then uh you know just came back from CES, so we saw a lot of, uh, you know, on the, I would say kind of the app side and the vision side of like some of the companies and products and services that are leveraging essentially the tool stack and the, you know, the software stack. If we're talking Bitcoin Lightning, uh, transaction related stuff, when they, you know, NFTs, all of that kind of stuff too, seeing, you know, the use cases that sit on top of these networks, um, kind of getting a heartbeat there. But yeah, always kind of moving forward. Um, you know, with the building stuff and fresh updates to the website to show where people are at, or, you know, where we're at right now on the stack. Hells yeah. Well, let's talk about C CES while we start there. A uh, lot of interest last year in 2021 for Bitcoin miners to go there. Yep. And get Bitcoin at just crypto peak, right? It was like November 2021, we hit like almost 70K. So CES came two months later and a lot of people were very excited. What was the feel on the ground there this year? Was there a lot of Bitcoin miners there? Uh, yeah, actually, surprisingly, there was quite a few uh, crypto people in general, Bitcoin miners, uh, Bitcoin mining, uh, like product companies that were adding on ancillary services. So we highlighted a few things on our Twitter. People scroll back a few pages around that January 4th through the 8th time. You'll see some of the stuff we were posting as we were kind of coming up to it. But a lot of just like like cheaper, innovative ways for cooling. So anybody that had like an S19 and had experience last summer. Uh, they would see that they, you know, like uh, trying to keep things quiet and cool. Um, so some companies trying to address that in some innovative ways. One of them uh, uh, with using essentially like the water cooler, water cooled setup that like uh, the Bitmain has on their like 215 terahash units. So there's a third party company called Cypher Power. We got to see their stuff in operation there at CES where essentially it's a, a cold plate that lays on your... Uh, you know, sets up and mounts to the S19 and then has, you know, same kind of water tubes and, and goes in essentially four, 420 millimeter, uh, radiators like you would get from like Corsair, right? So they, mm -hmm. they had this whole like cooling, uh, kit as they call it, um, where if you supply your own radiators, it's only 250 bucks for the plates and the tubing. And then it's $500 if it's everything. So you see in some like innovative space, like smaller consumer, you know, individual home miner, maybe one or two units looking for the summer, not having to spend for like immersive cooling. Cause you know, some, there was immersive cooling there, but you know, some folks don't want to dip their unit in there. It's kind of maybe like level two or three on the complexity and risk with like having to filter things to just go in straight with your current S9 with water cooling, you know, like you would do like on your mm -hmm. CPU or your uh, graphics card, if you're a gamer or something, you know, same kind of concept. So seeing things like that, that wasn't there a few years ago, but you can see now that the tech stack has moved really to the U.S. when it comes to like larger miners and stuff. You're, we're also getting a lot of the innovation now that has probably been in, in China and some of the other areas for a long time. We're just now seeing it here. So, you know, we were very surprised to see those type of vendors on the main state, on the main floor, right? We were at North, uh, I think it was uh, West Hall and North Hall at uh ces and they're just right there with all the bigger vendors um you know so it's not just in you know like i think two years ago they were like at the sands expo which i think now is the venetian expo but they were like in the smaller booths and like off to the side 
now they're on the main stage. So you can see this common theme. They had an entire section for uh, metaverse, AR, VR, you know, not too much of the word blockchain, which is interesting because, mm -hmm. you know, for years it's always been blockchain, not crypto. Actually now seeing cryptocurrency is like the mainstay there. They kind of dropped the blockchain tech, uh, naming, uh, which is also an evolution for, uh, you know, the space when it comes to like commercial business. Um, but yeah, I think everybody at some point had some discussion of crypto being a part of their pipeline. And I mean, we talked to Mercedes, we talked to Fidelity, digital services out there. Uh, there was, uh, who else? There was a couple other car companies that we had talked to, um, that were just looking at, you know, from not just accepting crypto, but just that it's in their pipeline. They see like, uh, NFT integration. Uh, I think it was AC Delco or one of the, uh, makers that make the, like the in dash car units. And they had like a browser and in that browser, I don't know if it was just somebody that was there that had, uh, there was a crypto crypto person, but there was MetaMask. And I was like, wait a minute, that's MetaMask. Like, and they're like, oh yeah, it supports, you know, uh, you know, like web three related stuff in, in the car yeah. browser. And I'm like, that's showing you like the, yeah. Is that the production side of things that are integrated into some of the vehicles and stuff as an example. So yeah, a lot of good positive stuff, uh, when it came to crypto in general. Did the term web three, was that floated around a lot? Cause I feel like people are just starting I, to touch that right now. Not, there were people that said, said the words of that, but it wasn't, um, there was actually a, uh, a banner that said web three and it was more down the development side of CES. There's, uh, where we saw some of the, you know, software related, um, stuff down at the Venetian center, but, uh, most of it was cryptocurrency spelled out as cryptocurrency, um, or, uh, you know, uh, crypto related services. Uh, th also there was a lot of synonymous metaverse with crypto. Like it, they kept it kind of in the same thing, even though like metaverse being AR, like metas, mm -hmm. uh, kind of try to implementation. Uh, there was, you know, like the first booth we went to was just all about NFTs. Um, yeah. capturing things with NFTs. Um, so like some, you know, connection with those, uh, that nomenclature really, uh, being synonymous with that. So, uh, I think that's the culture's now finally moving to accepting cryptocurrency as cryptocurrency, not blockchain. Um, yeah. I only seen one thing the whole time that we were there that said the word blockchain and it was still related to, I think IBM's, uh, booth. You know, because they, gotcha. even though they've cut back a lot on the blockchain on the like Hyperledger, they still have it and they're still supporting customers with it. So they, you know, had to have a booth related to blockchain. Yeah. Enterprise blockchain stuff doesn't seemingly die. The Avalanche network had an announcement this morning about some integration with AWS, but we don't steer too mm -hmm. much into that on this podcast. We don't want to trigger any of our maximalist <laughs> listeners for, for good reason. Well, you know, it's, you know, we're, we're uh, big you know, Bitcoin folks have always been in Bitcoin, uh, you know, since making the channel in 2013, um, and a very large supporter of it. But it's just like, when you look at crypto stack in general, there's a lot of developers out there that don't have the history, um, on, you know, Bitcoin and understand, I mean, maybe they've read the white paper, maybe they understand the innovation that Satoshi's brought with that. Um, but they're, they're, young and they're energetic in building software and services related to it because they still attach the concept of the decentralization and understand the importance of that and the privatization of things. And that's the space they want to be in and build in. And yeah. some of those gateways may be into some of these other cryptos. And as they learn more, I think you get that natural, when you start seeing like centralized type of activities with some of these other chains, it gravitates people to, well, what's less centralized or yeah, like, you know, like a Solana reboot of the network. It's like, wait a minute, how do we do that? And like in Bitcoin, oh, you don't. So it's like you start to understand. And I think part of that's education. I try not to get caught up in, you know, all of that more than, you know, what's the point of what you're trying to do and what's the difference between centralization and decentralization of things. And I think it naturally gets people there. But we had several conversations with people that were trying to understand those two differences. And um, I think it was at yeah. the Amazon booth. They had a whole Twitch section. Uh, you know, for people that are Twitch streamers and stuff like that. And I talked to a couple like popular Twitch streamers there. Um, and they were looking at inter you know, integrating, you know, crypto into their, uh, you know, not just from a compensation standpoint, but just 
how do I interact or capture moments and then produce those and, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, I think it's, it's the right kind of tone of people trying to understand it. Yeah. People come to Bitcoin from their own paths, right? So we all end up on different, uh, the same place, but different journeys there. Uh, kind of a follow-up question, but something that you were talking about earlier, Ethereum merged obviously last year in like September and your channel had a lot of GPU mining that was mm -hmm. from my understanding. And from the first time I started following your channel, I think like 2019 or so, uh, that was like the majority of your channel was devoted to GPU mining. Yeah, GPU What's mining. the transition yeah. been like to, to Bitcoin mining? It, it it's been or ring transition back. Yeah, it's been it's been a little slower just because the Bitcoin mining. So you have like the Bitcoin mining if you have a couple units, and that we did several videos on like maintaining a single unit and kind of the transition from GPU to ASICs and understanding like the the power differences, the cleaning differences, uh, what is similar to it, which there isn't a ton, um, but like the web interfaces, how to set up stuff. So it's been kind of more of an education of like, what is an ASIC and how do you operate it? And how would you do it at home? Just like you'd be like a GPU miner. Um, and then comparing and contrasting, you know, a, a GPU mining rig, like a modern one was like 600 to 800 Watts. It doesn't, it's not real loud. Um, it's at one point it was significantly less than an ASIC. Now it's kind of tables of turn. Like even in today's prices of GPUs, if you did like a six card mining rig, uh, let's say you're going to support Flux or Raven or you know ETC or something like that. That's still proof of work on the GPU side. Um, the, the GPU mining rig is going to be more than the ASIC now, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's how the tables have turned there. Um, but uh, you know, just trying to let people understand you know the sound uh, and that kind of thing. As we've grown to go with a larger deployment, whole different level of uh, effort on trying to explain the nuance to it, and it's it's not necessarily the Bitcoin mining content as much as it is the infrastructure development, right? So like, I think we tried a couple different videos where it was like explaining like how power systems work and some of the issues that we've had related to just getting certain things done with like the transformers and then like making sure that there's proper lugs in the container, that kind of stuff. And it's like, this isn't like the GPU mining is very simple. It's like GPUs, network, here's the basics. This is more like, okay, here's how you do power infrastructure at like two megawatts. You know, it's yeah. like a different type of uh, content. Scale, as it were. Yeah. yeah. Um, but trying to give people appreciation, that's really what we're trying to do on the channel of just like, here's a medium scale. We're talking five megawatts. That's quite a bit of electricity. It's four containers, about 1,200 units. You know, what's that look like? What's the, what's the tell and the, you know, the Gantt charts related to all the things that you would need to do to do something like that? There's obviously it's in the u.s so it's uh there's a lot of like zoning regulation there's sound or and stuff that you have to handle the the look of it uh there's a lot of different individuals you have to be part of uh, you know like you have to include in in some of the decision making from the power company to the local municipalities all that kind of stuff so there's a lot more to it than like the gpu mining farm if we look back you know in 2016 when we expanded the BBT farm up in Wisconsin, it was, it was a building, it was, you know, occupancy, but it was just a different kind of scale. Like we didn't have near the, the level of effort that was required for the Bitcoin mining. Uh, and a lot of that came down to just the load, right? The it's, you're talking a single 30 amp can run multiple GPU mining rigs. You're talking one 30 amp runs one ASIC, right? So yeah. now you got orders of magnitude on um, setting up a larger setup if you wanted to scale that with like friends and stuff and people like come back and they're like, Hey, you know, you guys are going to five megawatt. That's a lot, you know, but we've also worked and consulted with people that were like a group of close friends that said, Hey, we want to do this. And then they coalesced all their money together and they're building, you know, one or two container setup. Right. So it's yeah. still not like company. It's a group of friends that just decided to do it together. And then they'll take turns maintenancing it and kind of helping them get that structure set up. But it was, it's a lot harder, um, on the, on the implementation because of that power requirement being a lot higher. You know, we had 330 machines, you know, 2,500 GPUs on two megawatts. Yeah. Right. So, and it was under two megawatts. So what does know. that make you think about like network decentralization since you've moved from, you know, you were one of the earlier miners for Bitcoin mm -hmm. when you can do it at home or you do it in your garage and then you have to GPU mining because it, it was scalable within like, mm -hmm. you know, your resources at the time. 
And then now you're like having to like contact a local utility to ask if you can like wire up a, a huge hut to mine. Like, what does that make you think about with that? Because most people have not had that journey. Like, you know, 99.9% .9 of miners have never had that journey that you've had. Yeah. You know, I think it's part of it was, well, now it feels like we're masochists and we like pain, but like it's, you know, <laughs> just because of all the issues that you run into at scale. Um, yeah. However, the, I like the challenge and I like trying to figure out, is there a better way to do it and innovate on it? Um, I mean, it, it kind of goes to the, the reason for even making the channel back in 2013. Like we, I was mining in 2011, like late, late 2010. This is the day that you could mine with a GPU Bitcoin was the day that I found it. Like I saw a post to say, Hey, you can compile this, uh, C minor, uh, CG minor, um, and I compiled and started mining. And then it was like, okay, let's take this to a couple of GPUs. Let's take this more. And it was like trying to challenge to see what we could do. And then eventually got to the point of where we had a lot more GPUs in 2016. It was kind of going bigger. Um, it was more of like, what's it take? And then kind of where's that threshold of like, okay, this is going to involve a lot more people now. Um, and we kind of hit that on the GPU side with BBT Todd and myself really kind of maxing out at that that one location it was like okay this is way more than you know 2500 gpus is a lot for a couple of people to handle um where the same thing kind of happening with bitcoin it's just the the load is much higher so then it, it it crosses this threshold where you need different types of power you start talking like three phase 480 service and that's like new territory for us um so just kind of learning that and kind of walking people through that kind of journey of like, okay, here's the point where it's kind of like, okay, this is a little kind of crazy. Um, mm -hmm. I think that five megawatts is very attainable for a handful, you know, if you have a, a group of people. Uh, but after, you know, pretty much after that, you start getting into even more higher loads. Um, it, it's kind of that, that's kind of the edge. Uh, you're talking to 2,500 KVA transformers for that. Um, and it's still a, quite a bit for, you know, the common, you know, just minor. I mean, there's, even with minor prices where they're at right now, we'll probably get into that. Um, it's still pretty sizable investment. You know, it's in the millions, right? So it's, uh, but it's it's this journey that we were trying to be a network participant. And that's always been kind of that, that drive is like, you know, the fact that we can do this and it's not asking for permission, right? It's just, I mean, you have yeah. to ask for, for, for municipalities to put a box somewhere, right? And we have to make sure everything's good, but to connect to the Bitcoin network and be part of that ecosystem that is, uh, you know, trying to win that ticket, you know, on that pool, if you're doing pool mining, um, it's just, I don't know, it's like the challenge, right? It's the game theory piece of that, uh, that still really drives me. I think that's a, it's an amazing thing. And just the emails and stuff that we've gotten over the years of people from different countries from in the U S saying, you know, I found the channel. We, I tried it with a couple of GPUs. I plugged it in for the night and the next day I had, you know, this return and then, then maybe they've switched to some other ASIC or they've, you know, moved on to their own journey as they've learned more. Uh, maybe they wanted less maintenance. Uh, Bitcoin miners are a lot less maintenance than GPU miners were. There's a lot less issues. Um, so p some people went to ASICs faster than we did because I was all the way up pretty much to the Ethereum merge. Um, but, uh, we didn't want to get away from proof of work. Like I'm a very strong proof of work advocate. I don't think there's anything better than that right now. I'm not convinced on proof of stake. We're already seeing things with proof of stake that were kind of, uh, forecasted the, is yeah. the best way to say it. You know, when you're, when you're talking about, um, larger collusions and stuff that can happen or uh, censorship, it, it's just that try that trilemma that Vitalik talked about years ago, like you're giving up something. Right. Yeah. And I'm saying Satoshi had the most perfect system, but it is when you're looking at from a distribution and an individual coming into this permissionless finds the code, runs a node or decides to also participate in mining. There's just a natural evolution for that. I think in, in this space, once you discover it, so where I have to go to somewhere else to buy a token, right. To then maybe stake it. Right. It's just the model's different. Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm still not fully convinced on the, on the proof of stake. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're very pro proof of work. And I think, you know, there's a ton, Nick Carter and a lot of folks, which is not related, um, 
that spent a lot of time and research to to understand the consumption mechanisms and all the things that are coming when it comes to like where's the power come from our power having a, a majority of our power at any one point in time is wind power in Illinois we have a lot of Illinois uh, windmills here it was uh, mm -hmm. state quite a few uh, and that's offset with nuclear and coal so we don't have natural gas uh, on our uh, pipeline of where we're getting stuff from but they regulate it with the nuclear and the and the coal when there's not enough demand for the the in storage for this the wind power but um you know i think that over time this tech will and this incentive drives people to find the leanest cost of ownership also the leanest way to get power um and i, I don't know i i just the fact that we could do that anywhere on the planet is, and it's the same set of rules and the same set of terms. I, I, there's nothing like it. Yeah, it's a little weird feeling just knowing that you can just plug in the internet and earn some yield by having some computational cycles devoted to something. Let's move over and talk about uh, mining rewards right now, which obviously a lot of people are not super happy with Bitcoin mining, especially if they got in uh, during 2021. They're probably like, "Whoa, this yeah. is this is really painful," uh, and this the process that a lot of people have to take when they're getting into crypto. Luckily for myself, I got into Bitcoin during the last bear market. So uh, this is not too painful for me because I, I kind of started there. Uh, but some people came at the bowl and they're expecting coin prices up only forever. And then oh, yeah. that's not what happens. It's very cyclical. Uh, first chart, for those who are just listening on the podcast, we're going to go through three really quickly. The first one is difficulty adjustment for Bitcoin as a percent change and then just total and I, th I think the thing to hear or the thing I'm interested to hear from you personally is about the difficulty changes we've seen from cycle to cycle, maybe 2017, 2018, and then now 2021 to 2022. And it's just ratcheting up like crazy. Uh, this this chart for everyone who's listening obviously can't see it. It's just up and to the right with a little blip from the China ban in the summer of 2021. Uh, but any thoughts when you're looking at a chart like this, uh, as especially as a Bitcoin miner who now has five megawatts of load. Yeah. I mean, it all comes back down to anybody that's doing modeling on this really needs to understand their, their cost to operate and understand that everybody has a cost to operate. So I look at it from a very, if you look at everything from very baseline is like, what's the minimal cost out there that I'm ever going to compete with on ops cost, right? So we're all participants. Um, but at the end of the day, what's it cost for us to run hashes compared to the rest of the stack? And when you look at that from just not just power rate, everybody goes to power rate and what's your kilowatt per hour. That's one component. Uh, kilowatt, you could have a really good kilowatt per hour, but you could have a like not a very optimized, uh, you know, uptime, it, it, depending on your service. Uh, you know, do you have to shut off a lot more? That type of thing. There's different uh, situations you can get into where you can't run 100, you know, you're never going to run 100%. You're always going to have some downtime, but like, do, are you having payroll and folks that have to go out there and service a lot and it's out of sequence and now you're you're paying a lot more on those costs so what's the all-in cost not just your power rate so really understanding what it takes to operate at that i think is a critical piece uh and what we're seeing i think on these pullbacks obviously is there's there's been a couple large uh miners out there they've had some of their situation maybe changed when it came to you know, they, maybe they're natural gas and they didn't read fine print and, you know, pricing ratchet up, you know, we got inflation issues and then it, it really prices them out, you know, with a Bitcoin price coming down. Right. So you have this natural equilibrium that occurs in the Bitcoin space, uh, in proof of work in general around the world based on total cost of operating. Right. So really understanding that, uh, and all you can do is the, the, you can understand what other people are paying, but at the end of the day, it's like if your energy rate is reasonable, and I would say sub five cent is reasonable power rate, like all in, I'm talking your distribution, your taxes, all of it. If you're under like a five cent rate, then you're, you should be able to operate. Now it's a matter of leaning out your operations the rest of the way of keeping as lean as possible to keep operating and keep running. Um, and you know, that's where you're kind of seeing it balancing where you're seeing a drop right now on the current hash rate, uh, where people that are either over that, or there's some other existential situ situation. Maybe it's a, a bad loan rate, 
on return of capital and they can't it's they may have a great energy rate but they're just not able to return to pay off loans because maybe their loans are eight to ten percent and they're just not generating that much margin so it really comes down to like if you're borrowing capital or if you're getting um you know some kind of equity agreement you know type of thing to let make sure that everybody understands the, the um this model what's going on here from a profitability standpoint and then understand where you can operate at uh, and best communicate that. So I think what ends up happening in this kind of thing where we have that kind of mashup of price and, and difficulty now that's been it kind of clicked up and then that's came down now twice. We've had two back to backs. Um, and who knows more people might turn on cause we have $18,400 Bitcoin price right now or a little higher now. I think it went up a little higher today. Um, but there is that equilibrium and I think we're seeing it. I think we're at that kind of equilibrium price for some of the larger miners that have had a shut down. So I think understanding that's a, a critical piece. You know, if you don't have a model that really forecasts out different scenarios, um, including the having that's coming up, right? Because most of these things are not, um, no matter if you were at zero percent power or zero cost power, which nobody would be really at zero cost. There's always a cost somewhere, even if it's partially subsidized, it's going to hit you somewhere. Um, you're still at probably a 16 to 18 month ROI. Um, on some of these units, right? If you're paying, you know, a shipped unit, it's sixteen dollars hair hash plus you got to get shipped. Maybe you're at twenty dollars hair hash all in. It's going to take you sixteen months, you know, to kind of pay that back, right? So we're going to cross over really close to that a, a having. So, um, you know, what's those models look like, and how how are you ready to adjust for that? And I don't think there's been any data out on the the new Intel stuff too. So, like, what's the next tech stack that comes out that pushes up? the entire stack at a better efficiency rating than everybody else too. Cause that's another really key piece. Um, yeah, we'll get to ASICs in a, in a second on the next one. So here's the second chart for those listening. This is minor revenues versus yearly average. And it's very similar. You know, you got that pop in 2018 and then uh, a slight pop in late 2019 when we had that 14 K Bitcoin run that a lot of people don't remember about. Uh, and then of course the big pop in 2021, and a collapse in 2022. Uh, so this is just yearly mining revenue. And I think it just backs up a lot what you were just saying, right? If you mm. don't have things lined up correctly, then uh, you are going down and to the right, and then difficulty will keep going up and to the right as well. Uh, but yeah, these these charts are they're informative to look at, but they're always backwards looking, right? So I, I, mm-hmm. I sort of like the inputs that you're talking about there, like the, the sub five cents you need to find. Uh, curious on your thoughts though, and we talked about this a little bit before the show, about deploying capital right now and a lot of these charts are scary to people who are like ah, i don't want to touch the space but you know, you've been mining since 2010 2011 and you're deploying capital right now uh what are your mm-hmm. thoughts on like holding bitcoin buying bitcoin buying asics holding asics or just holding cash or something else yeah i, th- I think it starts so we started this venture to do this uh this larger operation almost a year so it's it's taken that much time to get through all of the, I would call it the local regulatory pieces. We had actually had to move a site in the middle of this, like we thought was done. And then, uh, you know, zoning came back and said they couldn't do a special use order on the spot that we were going to do. I mean, we were six months in, we actually had containers at the site. If if people go back like six months on our, on our Twitter, it's like, Hey, the containers are here. They're here. Here's a substation. Well, it came back. Uh, everybody thought it was a move and it was good and it changed. So uh, some of these things take some time, but part of what drove all of those decisions to play capital, even in a descending market was that idea of what we had from the model of what our all in costs were going to be. We really understood like, okay, how much from a personnel standpoint is this going to be? What ki- type of personnel are we going to need, uh, for this many units? And then what's our energy rate and our energy rate around here is very decent, um, with an all in cost, right, right at four cents so it's the energy rates in the low threes and you have distribution all this other stuff plus incentives if we meet certain uh you know curtailment uh during peak loads so like there's incentives to save on some of that distribution costs if we're hitting those and most of those are forecasts it's very interesting i think i could write a different script for them that's better but the the comp third party companies that have to give us like when our shutdowns are to try to save that cost avoidance you know have that cost avoidance 
that's still just a math problem unless Bitcoin like shoots to the moon, then it's like, I'll pay that cost because I don't want to turn off, right? So there is a, some some variables in your cost modeling. So understanding that and understanding when it makes sense to power down and take the cost avoidance route uh, and, and then save you on the long tail of the whole month. Like if you have to shut down for 20 hours in a month and it could save you like two charges, like I think it's a $7 and a $2 per kilowatt charge we get. Um, if we meet the obligation based on the curtailment, right? So then that's real money. So the difference on that's like from 208,000 a month to 153,000 a month, right? So there's a 50 grand savings. Well, it's an algebra problem to figure out what's, what's the return, uh, that if we're going to exceed that, there's a point in time where we're like, we'll pay it. Right. Cause we don't want to turn off. Right. So having your model set up with that kind of stuff is critical. So you under fully understand where what's going to hit you, um, and I think that kind of gets you set up with enough due diligence that then allows you to get to that decision point of like, okay, what's it going to cost for us to build it? We understand what our operating is because operating is everything as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you have that initial core cap to build whatever facility you're doing, and then the acquisition of miners. Buying miners are very important right now. Buying in a in a bear, everything's very cheap. So your major cost of everything um, is buying larger miners, and those are really cheap right now. So if you have all of that cost modeling in your core cap, and you understand what that is, then it comes down to the last piece. I think is where do you think everything's going? Right? Why would you go through this with the tight margins that there are, as we're seeing right now? And I think it comes down to back to where's your vision where. Bitcoin in this space is going. And I go out, I lean back towards the CES part that I was in the very beginning where I go and try to get the heartbeat of the rest of the industry that not, that are not mining, but are building applications and services on this platform. And I'm looking at where's the investments coming into? Are there people building trade fi desk? Are there, is there uh, innovation happening in the space that's, that's giving it a size that's more than just the proof of work mining and being able to trade between me and you, right? So there, there's a definitely a use case for that. And I don't think Bitcoin will ever go away because of that, but will market contract down to just support just that? Or is it going to be bigger? Is it going to be integrated into society where it's just the foundation at some point? I think it's going to go that route because I don't think there's anything better than, than what we've seen with this. And I think the rest of the market, since we're looking at this chart from 2011 to now, We've seen that I think a lot of the world has started to agree with that. And yes, it has its ups and downs, but if the future of that is a, a growth and an exponential growth, then as a miner, you're just supplying security. And for that security, you're paid in a token, right? So that, I think that, that gives you your, your confidence variable of like, do I do this or not? Cause I have the linear numbers, um, and I have some forecasts of where those linear numbers can go and good accounting would have, you know, your plan, your actual, and then your latest estimate, right? What's your heartbeat at, right? So your latest estimate is giving you like, how is this thing tracking to where we were thinking, right? And then that gives you some decisions on your other phases, which is, do I expand? When do I buy new miners? All that kind of stuff. You need to have that latest estimate. So I think good accounting and due diligence in the space, understanding all the variable and numbers, or critical and then understanding what's the vision do you believe in it enough to stay the kind of longer haul because all of this is not short term right this is bitcoin mining cryptocurrency mining in general is a longer term play um in general uh so i think it's it, that though all those things are very critical and then for any in potential investors that would be investing into a group that's doing that i would expect that that group would at least be able to answer some of that in their particular situation with their particular costs and their particular, you know, uh, burn rates and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's definitely a long-term game as composed as a compare, I should say, to other token models out mm -hmm. there. Um, let's go to the next slide. Let's talk about ASIC prices a little bit, which has been very interesting. You even brought up the uh, Intel miner, which we now know that Hive blockchain has mm -hmm. deployed their own variant of the Intel chip. They made their own mm -hmm. miner to put that inside of and a lot of people are waiting to see what the results are from that. I think they're calling mm -hmm. Buzz Miner. And they're also looking to see like about this Intel chip itself. That being said, Bitmain's not really stopping. I think they just put out S19 Pro Plus and it's uh, fairly cheap. I think it's like $16 per terahash on a few different markets. 
So there's still pressure from a supply side. There's still some innovation in the ASIC markets and prices are sort of hitting a bottom floor right now. Uh, from your perspective as a purchaser of ASICs and then just someone who's been watching uh, the ASIC stack for a while, what's your take on the, the current marketplace? Uh, I mean, it's it's a buyer's market for sure. There, and there, it's not just from the manufacturers themselves. There's a lot of folks that maybe didn't do some of that due diligence or their situation changed and now they're sitting on the miners because they bought the miners up front. Um, we held back and didn't buy miners at the time. But, for logistics reasons, for security reasons, for all kinds of reasons, like, like, well, until we're deployed and we know that we're good, it was kind of like toll gates, right? So we were, it was kind of like we, a lot of the development in the process, we use uh, essentially like a Demeti process, which is like define, measure, explore, development, implement, right? So we really didn't get the miners in toward, towards close to implement, right? So like we knew we had defined, we had measured, we were exploring different options and looking at like, uh, where are we going to go? And then as we started to kind of do the, the beginning parts of the development, then we started looking at where ASICs were at that, that time. If we would have bought at the beginning, cause that's just natural, right? You're like, all right, I've done the model. Maybe you've done just a quick calculation. Let's go buy miners. Don't do that. <laughs> that's a terrible, terrible time to do it because you're probably going to sit on them for a while. And now you got capital wrapped up in this thing that's not, that's not doing anything for you yet. So it doesn't make sense right away. But I would say, you know, it worked out for us because the market came down. We were going to do, we were going to purchase no matter what, wherever it was at when it was time to do it. But it's just the market was, it came down quite a bit. And then that did adjust some of our models like, okay, what's the return? What, how do we lean this a little down? I mean, even our own team, we were up to nine people or down to five, right? So we, we had to shorten some of the stuff down ourselves. Uh, in this market to to adjust to some of the stuff but like from a minor standpoint it looks like a lot of stuff's really flat right around that 16 dollars a tera hash um from a new unit standpoint i mean that ces canon was there uh it was a c-a-n a-a-n um and they were essentially like if you got power we'll give you miners for free right but they wanted some kind of an equity agreement type of thing but like like there's a lot of opportunity right now in the space um from a minor standpoint if you have power and the operations to be able to build a solution. Um, Cause I think that's one of the part, the, the major critical pieces of it. So if you do have power, a good cost and you're willing to build it like miners, I dare say they're free, but there's definitely equity agreement deals that are out there. There's really low cost right now. Um, and from a deployment of capital and what, where's your risk at? I mean, if you look at that spread on this here where you have the, the hydros, I don't really consider the hydros as part of the normal equation because that's a whole level of, of like complexity of building a farm. The hydros are on a whole other level. Um, and we have some videos out on, we went out to Merkel about five months ago, um, Merkel standard, which has the hydro miners and they deployed them and they're doing a fantastic job, but they also have a water treatment plant on site. It just came with the site they bought. Right. So you know, water glyco mixes being at, you have to test it every day. You have to have 24, seven, 365 operations. That's way different than the typical miner. And you do that because everything's pressurized, right? You like all these miners are running and you got like water. <laughs> so like when you have pumps and water and things happening, you got to have people on site, right? Cause if you have a water break and you start soaking a whole bunch of miners, not good. Right. Um, climates where those go. So all the hydro stuff, why they look, they look enticing and their rates are right. Your cost of operations, I would say, really look at that, right? Um, to see if it's worth, you know, that kind of investment. Um, and if your situation makes sense because you have water treatment or you have like chemist with you, probably makes a better sense. But like, so then I take those kind of out of the stack. So then I look at just, you know, S19s, the current what's minor stuff and just kind of see depending on Intel's and Samsung stuff that's coming out, like, is it going to be orders of magnitude? Probably not. I think we're at the edge of the the tip of the spear anyways, when it comes to the tech stack, um, you know, at the tooling, right? We're at five nanometer. They're going to be getting the three nanometer. Maybe we're going to get, you know, uh, 200 tera hash normal units, but we're really at that edge thermodynamically. So I don't see a, like, unless there's a breakthrough on the way to do this, I don't see like, we get 500 terahash units as an example, right? So 
and it doesn't seem like anything's in the pipeline from that. Even the latest S19s are at 140. You can overclock them. Uh, but it all comes back down to efficiencies right now with the costing and stuff. Like I see a lot, like Bitmain just came out with the low power mode, right? And you look at uh, 2200, 2400 watts of power, you're at darn near base level one, you know, XP efficiencies because you're not using as much and you're getting, you know, 86 terahash out of a 110 terahash unit. Uh, but you're only using 2200 watts. So I, I see people kind of optimizing. So they're total tear hash. And that could be part of the drop in the Bitcoin, you know, difficulty in, in general is people are starting to get into this kind of low, like let's lean it out as low as possible cost wise uh, and efficiencies. Um, and, uh, you know, GP miners would do that back in the day would do the same thing, right? We would try to optimize the most uh, performance per watt, right? So, um, I see, I see that being the kind of longer term game. So like if you're choosing and picking, I think it more comes down to, you know, base is your hundred terahash, 104 terahash units, even the 96s, we have 96s and 88 units here, the newest ones. So, uh, they're really efficient, you know, 2,600, 2,700 watt, 86 terahash units. So like, I think it's more about what's the total efficiency and you kind of just go with what's there at a, at a reasonable price. Yeah, to your efficiency point, uh, Bitfarm has put out their monthly update for December. It said they saved about four megawatt hours just over the month uh, by tuning their stack correctly on one of their one of their farms. So I assume that's really taking a toll on things. One thing I want to boot over to is a question about ASIC supplier. There's a glut of ASICs that we see on the market. Mm -hmm. There's been one estimate I saw. Uh, it was about one million ASICs to some boxes. I've seen even larger numbers. Saw one estimate that there is about 250,000 idle ASICs to sitting on floors in Texas warehouses. And now that's mm -hmm. about a few months ago, but curious to get your thoughts on it. I know from a few deployments I've heard of, tens of thousands of ASICs sitting on racks waiting for energy. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was from energy to just, you know, companies that are kind of in some kind of state of maybe they're trying to get recapitalized in some way to deploy them. You know, they, un they, they bought the ASICs and now they're waiting, you know, that kind of not buying it to the end type of thing. Um, but yeah, I know, I, I do know that there's quite a few out there when we were kind of sourcing for our own stuff here. Um, th there was quite a few opportunities, a lot of the stuff that people are looking for, like compute North and that kind of stuff, the things that were going through any kind of litigation, some of that stuff's going to sit out there for a bit, why it's going through all the arbitration and all the, you know, understanding the inventorying, all that kind of stuff. There was also some speculation that some of the, uh, the miners from Celsius and stuff would come available and. You know, there's, there's a lot of different reasons why certain things are offline right now. But yeah, if we look at what this, if Bitcoin starts to ratchet up, I think you have a couple different uh, states of things. You have miners that are in place powered off because maybe their power agreement um, required them to only have so much online. Like uh, I'll give you an example, our power agreement, 1.5 megawatts of five megawatts, we're getting charged that no matter what, right? So 1.5 megawatts is going to get charged to us, like if we're using it or not. So that's our minimum requirement, right? So there could be a situation where miners are in that kind of situation where there's literally set on a rack plugged in, but because of their cost, doesn't make sense for them to run it. Bitcoin starts to ratchet up in price. You're going to have those turn back on. And that there is like cradle to grave on that is a few minutes, right? So you can see a bump of those coming on and how much actual hash rate of these last two, you know, tick downs is going to come back online because of that kind of activity is a question. And then you do have a lot in boxes right now waiting for, you know, uh, I always watch Giga Chat out there uh, putting, uh, you know, updates out to their different locations as they've been expanding uh, Riot. And, you know, they know they're going to bring a whole bunch more online too that are sitting there ready to go. So I think it really comes down to, um, you know, as Bitcoin starts to ratchet up, Bitcoin's price, while uh, while the narrative around Bitcoin miners is probably some level of influence, like Bitcoin price will do what a Bitcoin price does, right? It's not necessarily directly correlated. Um, but like it could start to, we're already seeing a bump up. If we start getting into like every day, it's a thousand dollars. And before we know it, we're back at 30 K. You're going to see, I, I think you'll see a lot more turn on. We'll get an awareness of how many were just setting idle. Um, but yeah, I, I, there are several people still building and there are some that are in financial, uh, issues and are coming off. So we might stay flat for a little bit, but I mean, this thing's going to go up. I mean, it's just all of our modeling shows everything going up pretty at a pretty good tick. 
Thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. Appreciate your time as always. Yep. Hopefully, have you again soon uh, back on the for show sure. in 2023. Yeah, I would love once we're once we're online and stuff. Uh, maybe doing a, a tour with you guys or something like that. Oh yeah, up and running. You're always welcome. Before you go, we got to get the hash rate projection for the end of 2023. I think we're around 260 exahash. What's your projection for end of this year, December 31st, 2020? I, I think our model had it around 365. So I think okay. that's going to ratchet up quite a bit. I think it's going to go third. Okay. The third. The hash rate index crew was projecting, I think if memory is right, like 350. Maybe it was 3.30. They're going to get mad. They're going to listen to this and get mad at me. Yeah. But, uh, it was a little lower than what you just said. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, a lot can... A, there's a lot of things that are coming down the pipeline from a regulatory standpoint. We're going to see what happens with FTX and all that. Um, and if that has any influence on decision-making, is there going to be rash decision-making and there's like executive orders that come out? Is there like... There's a lot still kind of at float that none of us can control. Um that at least in the U S that are going to have at some level of impact, um, or it could go very bullish and, you know, we get proper, uh, uh, effects on FTX and it makes the market bullish because now there's like, okay, finally we've got some, uh, uh, some justification of like putting people in jail type of thing that do bad things. And then we see, you know, a confidence get restored because now maybe FINRA and everybody gets kind of their stuff in order. FINRA, FTC, uh, or CFTC, SEC, they kind of get a line and now they have a vision and that gives retail market a better, uh, safer place that they want to be at. And then it, you'll start to see more uh, dollars kind of come into this and then it kind of solidifies stuff. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of existential stuff that, that affect us, right? But, um, yeah, I think that... I think we're we're seeing it right now that that we're seeing the price structure kind of ratchet up, and I don't know. I'm bullish. I'm bullish for this year. Perfect place to end it, Michael. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Awesome, bud.